My name is Giles Smith, and welcome to our community. Thank you, Mr. Alejandre, for uh, submitting for this interview. You're welcome. Hey, okay. great. Well, I'm a lifelong resident of San Bernardino County. I was born and raised in San Bernardino County. I grew up in San Bernardino. In fact, I grew up right behind San Bernardino Valley College. So San Bernardino Valley College was a paradise for me when I was a young child. As I grew up, I graduated from school in San Bernardino and enlisted into the military. I would serve four years active duty at Northern Air Force Base. And when I completed my active duty tour, I started to work for Rialto Unified School District in the Fiscal Services Department. Um, I was continuing to work on my bachelor's degree, and at the time when I completed it, I started my educational career in San Bernardino City Unified. In San Bernardino City Unified, I was an elementary teacher, uh, elementary vice principal, elementary principal, middle school principal, and director of fiscal services before being accepted as the assistant superintendent of business services for Yucaipa Calamesa School District of which I served for four years at. And I loved Yucaipa Calamesa School District. I was really involved in all the business aspects of the district. And when uh, Dr. Gary Thomas was appointed county superintendent, I applied for his position as assistant superintendent of business and was selected and have been working at the county office ever since. So as a deputy superintendent of San Diego County Superintendent Schools, I'm responsible for the entire business division, which includes internal and external business, governance, and all of the areas that are associated with that. And uh, we interact quite frequently with our school districts, 33 of them in our county, in business-related areas as well as curriculum-related areas. And as we move forward in these times, there are some historic changes that will be taking place in education that will involve our county office significantly with school districts as they meet and continue to improve their instructional programs. Outstanding. Uh, can you tell us the state of education in our county? State of education is strong in our county. Now, when the Public School Accountability Act happened back in 1999-2000, it introduced an accountability measure for schools in California. And the indicator is known, widely known now, as API, Academic Performance Indicator. And so to get your score at an individual school, you're going to be between 0 and 1,000. The state target eight is 800. And right now, we have many schools that have exceeded the 800 target, and the average is getting closer and closer to 800, far from where it first started. So it really shows the efforts and the commitments that school district superintendents and staffs, teachers, paraprofessionals throughout, paraprofessionals throughout our county have done to increase student achievement. It's been phenomenal, and ever since 2007, we've been taking deficits. We had over a 20% reduction in our revenue limit since 2007 and even with those reductions school districts have continued to move forward and that's really due to the commitment of parents and staffs and teachers and administrators that collectively have worked to increase student progress. Uh, we're this year we're moving into a new accountability system and that system is going to involve a new assessment measure so the times we have right now are surely historic as we move forward. So education overall is doing pretty well. Yes, it is. And not to say there's not challenges. There's still a number of challenges that we have. We continue to work strong to increase graduation rates, to continue to increase student achievement. Um, we're moving forward in a number of different areas, particularly in curriculum standards as we implement Common Core. So the challenges we have for the future are significant, but our st staffs across our county, our superintendents, teachers, and every stakeholder we have are ready for this challenge and we're going to see that growth take place in our county. Well you talked earlier about how the state government has implemented a new model uh, yes. for funding. How is that going to affect uh, or help the students? Major change. In the past we used to have a funding model that was referred to as base revenue limit and so all districts across our county had a similar dollar level per student under the model. On top of those dollars were what were referred to as state categorical programs. So it was money that was designed for specific areas like music, PE, fine arts, remediation program. And while that, those funds were helpful, they were restricted to specific uses. 
And sometimes it was difficult, many times it was difficult for districts to use those in an effective manner. And so what Governor Brown proposed and was successful in implementing was the local control funding formula, LCFF, as it's referred to. A major change in the way school finance takes place. Uh, the governor introduced a term called subsidiarity. And what the new model represents is really decisions being made at the local level because local individuals are the ones that are best knowledgeable in terms of what students need to be successful. So rather than decisions being made up in Sacramento, they're made at the local level with school boards and district superintendents and district staff in terms of what student needs. So in this new model, every district has a base amount of funding for each grade level. And then on top of that, there's two different augmentations. One at kindergarten through third grade, to keep class sizes low, and there's another augmentation at grades 9 through 12, and those funds are designed for career tech programs for secondary students. So every district will get those funds. On top of those funds is where it becomes very different, because there's two additional pieces of funding that are referred to as supplementary grants and concentration grants, and those dollars are determined based upon the demographics of a district. So for districts that have high numbers of English language learners, foster youth, and socioeconomically disadvantaged students, then they are going to get much more dollars for those students than districts that don't. So for example, what would be called a low LCFF district in our county, that district may get 100 new dollars per student this year compared to a high LCFF district, a district with large numbers of those students, they get closer to $600 per student. And so where there's greater need comes greater dollars. And the challenge but opportunity for districts at the high LCFF level is that they can now determine how these dollars are going to best benefit students. The benefit for all districts is that these dollars replace the old model. And so where you used to be restricted to use the dollars for specific purposes, now districts have the opportunity to use these dollars in any way they want, the ways that they feel are most appropriate for students. And so that is a huge difference from where the model used to be and where it is now. So what's going to stop the districts from using it, as you stated, any way they wish? Great point. That comes into play in the Local Control Accountability Plan. It's a new requirement that all districts have that they would never had before in terms of building an instructional plan that has to come through the county office. And it's based upon eight state criteria. And that criteria involves student achievement, student engagement, their student performance, the environment of a school campus. Probably the most exciting area is in the stakeholder engagement because what districts have to show is how they've engaged the public in terms of receiving their input, getting their ideas, getting their feedback, sharing with them the data, sharing them with them the strategies and the techniques and programs that they have in place for students and together as a team they determine what's best for students to grow in that district. And that's the uniqueness and the flexibility that every district will have. And so what we're seeing in our county are districts that are establishing what's referred to as community cabinets. In the past, schools in general throughout the state have been somewhat closed off from opening their doors to the public. Many decisions were made, you know, more of an internal basis. Uh, not to say that was 100%, but just in general, that's the feel that many people felt school districts. Now we're seeing school districts open their doors and they're inviting the community in. They're inviting the stakeholders in. You know, we have great examples in our county, in Apple Valley, in San Bernardino City, in Colton, and many districts in our county where they're inviting their partners, they're inviting the businesses, they're inviting the faith-based organizations, they're inviting labor, they're inviting all of the individuals who have a stake in the students in that districts to achieving the best they can. And by taking this collective input, they're able to build their plan along the eight criteria the states identified to build the best program possible. So this year, being that it's brand new, will be the first year that it's in place. In subsequent years, districts will have to show how their students measure. So in all of these areas, they're going to have to have criteria and measurements 
that they're going to be able to benchmark student progress from one year to the next. And that's going to be the exciting piece because they're going to really focus on what means the most to them in their districts. Well, that kind of goes back to accountability. It's going to be it's going to be a huge impact because I mentioned earlier these are really historic times in education. And there's really four areas that make these historic times. The first is that we now have the funding model as I described, which really changes the funding level. You know, I mentioned how the model was designed, but the net result is that when districts get fully funded on this model, and it's projected to take eight years to get to the target, there's going to be a differential of over $3,000 per student from a low district to a high district. So when you see that significant difference in funding, then districts have more resources where there's more need, and districts will have an opportunity to build their plans accordingly based upon the students' needs in their district. So that's one piece. The second piece is the accountability plan, which I touched on. Now the districts have this plan, which has to be aligned with the eight criteria. The next two components really involve curriculum, because we're in the midst right now of implementing common core standards. And so the common core standards really emphasize areas that businesses have always asked for, uh, the ability for students to be uh, collaborate and, and work in teams and be involved in projects that involve critical thinking, problem-based learning, you know, uh, being able to deal and analyze issues from a level to where they come up with creative solutions to solve problems, technology, uh, writing and reading continue to be strong emphasis in the common core standards. And where before we had assessments that were that gave us the data to determine how our districts did against other districts in the state of California, now we're going to be measuring our performance against 44 other states who have adopted common core standards. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be comparing our students to other states, apples to apples. And that will give us data that really show how strong our students are based upon the entire country's performance using these same standards. And so the fourth piece is aligned to that is because the assessments are smarter balance. It's, it's referred to as smarter balance assessments. And the questions that students will be taking on the smarter balance assessments involve questions that they're not used to from previous types of exams. We all remember that when we took uh, state standardized tests and we were given the tests and we had to use a number two pencil and we bubbled in A, B, C, or D. <laughs> the assessment system that's going to be field tested this spring involve computers, devices, however a district designs it, but it has to be done through technology. It has to be done through computers. And so students are going to take questions that are aligned with Common Core and answer those questions using computers. And that's far different from what they've done before. In fact, I have a, a sample of a question that will give you an idea of what this test will look like. So this is an eighth grade math question. And remember, students are taking this test on a computer. So the question is, Justin's car can travel 77 and a half miles with three and one-tenth gallons of gas. Kim's car can travel 99 and one-fifth miles with three and one-fifth gallons of gas. At these rates, how far can each car travel with one gallon of gas? Drag each person's car to the number line to show the number of miles. So the question is far different than computational types of questions that students have been previously taking. Not that there weren't problems that involved um, uh, problem solving types of questions, but these questions are far different than the way they approach student learning. It's much more uh, involved in the critical thinking aspect of what students need to do to accomplish success on these tests. For decades, we've been debating how to improve schools in the United States this has been born from a realization that, in an ever-changing world, our students need better knowledge and tools to prepare them to compete in the global economy. In math, science, and reading, our students haven't been keeping pace with their most advanced international peers. Persistent and dramatic achievement gaps still exist in our country. College remediation rates are abysmal and employers say students are unprepared to perform and thrive in the workforce. The need to audaciously confront these issues resulted in a remarkable collaborative effort, the promise of consistent, shared, and rigorous education standards for all students that align with college and work expectations, a new set of ambitious academic standards to set the foundation for even greater student growth and success. 
These standards, now being implemented by more than 44 states across the nation, were built upon strengths and lessons learned in states. They were informed by other top performing countries and grounded in research and evidence. And practitioners, content experts, teachers, researchers, and leaders in higher education and business all came together to make it happen. These standards were developed by states and for states. They are the clearest statements yet about the knowledge and skills that students need to master in order to be prepared for college and the workforce. The standards were designed with great care to ensure that they were clear, consistent, rigorous, and relevant. All are undeniably important when it comes to preparing students to successfully meet the demands of college and the workplace. Thanks to the unprecedented collaboration among states, young people, regardless of their background or where they live, will be taught to standards that once mastered will have prepared them for college and career success. Take a glimpse into the promise of these standards as states do the hard work of implementing them with fidelity and care. Use what you hear to start engaging conversations, stimulate creativity in the classroom, help align expectations, and get communities involved. Find out why state standards are far from common. Higher education played a crucial role in the development of the Common Core Standards. It was so important to the development of these standards to ensure that students who completed these standards were truly ready for the requirements of credit-bearing courses in college. And it was a wide range of higher educators, professors and faculty, as well as administrators, coming together across disciplines to find that core within mathematics and literacy that was truly the most powerful for advancing students in their disciplines. And at the same time, higher education played a crucial role. So did the business community and employers, giving us a vivid sense of precisely what was most needed for the employees who would succeed as they began jobs and began training programs. And it's remarkable how much overlap there was in the command of sufficiently complex texts, in the range and flexibility of mastery that allows students to both read and write about that text and speak and listen about it, in the kind of isolated individual performance that requires, as well as the collaboration that requires in both higher education as well as in the career setting. So both higher education and the career community really collaborated in a magnificent way, helping to forge the common standards. Welcome back to Our Community, brought to you by the CYAP. Uh, one of the uh, trademarks of the County Superintendent of Schools is not to set our organization as a compliance-based organization. We really have tried to be service-oriented. That's our focus and that's our goal. So as we have requirements that come from the federal government and the state government, we really try to be a supportive agency to school districts and provide them with guidance, provide them with support so that they can be successful in their districts. In this new model of flexibility and subsidiarity, where districts have the ownership of the decisions they make, the county office wants to have those decisions be totally owned by the districts. But where districts need support, we want to be able to provide that support. As we do have to approve their instructional plans, and so as they submit those plans, we'll be working as a partner and as a collaborator to support their plans and meet the, the success that they're trying to achieve for their students. So we're definitely a service-based organization. Could you tell us more about the cradle to career concept? It's, it's, a, it's a great, uh, it's tying nicely with the county-wide vision. The county approached uh, Dr. Gary Thomas, our superintendent, as they were working on their county-wide vision. And Dr. Thomas and Dr. Morales from Cal State agreed to lead the education element. And so when you look at cradle to career, you're lo really looking at how you can best serve the needs of students from early infancy to preschool to K-12 
and beyond and have indicators, both educational indicator and social indicators, in terms of what students need at those grade levels so they can be successful. But it's not done just through K-12, it's done in working with partners, working with individuals from business, working with people from the housing community, working with other support agencies throughout the county so we can all be working in the same path to support student needs. That's the huge benefit of having a collective impact approach is by bringing in the resources and the partners to focus on what we know students need the most. So we developed a cradle to career roadmap and that roadmap is being adopted by many districts throughout our county so we can all focus on the same goals to have students be successful. One of the key questions that our community really wants to know is about the dropout rate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and all districts are approaching the dropout rate uh, aggressively because the goal is to increase graduation rates. And, and the, one of the most uh, successful ways based upon research is to have an early indicator warning system so the districts know when students are at risk of not furthering their careers and, at, and dropping out. Uh, for example, I'll share a uh, program we had when I was in Yucaipa Cala Mesa School District. It was very effective. Uh, we had a ninth grade campus. And so in many schools, what you'll see is when students enter high school in ninth grade, pretty soon they start to realize they don't have the credits to be successful and they start right. to drop out. They're getting Fs, they're getting Ds, they're not getting credit for classes, and you see those student enrollments start to drop. And by 10th grade, you have a lot less students than you had in ninth grade. So, and that continues on the grade levels and perpetuates the dropouts. So we want to avoid that and come up with programs that will change that, that pathway. And so in Yucaipa, when we had the ninth grade, pro, ninth grade campus, we had a program that was called the BRACE program. And so we had a little over 700 students that entered ninth grade, and by the end of ninth grade, we still had 700 kids in ninth grade. Yeah. And that's because they identified kids that were at risk of failing, the ones that were getting poor grades. And we brought in a team of educators at the school to not only identify those students, but to develop success pathways for them to be successful. How could they make up their units? How can they stay on track? How can they get some support, remediation, so they can complete their classes and finish off ninth grade? Because if they were successful in ninth grade, they had a much stronger chance of being successful at 10th grade and continuing to graduate. Yeah. So a program like that is very successful, but there's no doubt we have to continue to improve the rates. You know, I've read a book called The Coming Jobs War. It's by Jim Clifton, who's the CEO for Gallup. And when you read the book, there's one part of it that talks about the dropout rate and about some polling they did with students. And there's a couple of key issues that students have that lead them to drop out. One is they see themselves in high school and they start to look at where they're going to be after high school and they don't see anything there. They lose hope. Mm -hmm. They drop out. For us to be able to have them to be ready for college and career when they graduate is huge and will give them the motivation to succeed, right. to have a pathway for success so that they know if they graduate from high school, they'll be successful post high school and for the rest of their life. That's what we want to accomplish to see them be successful. And the other is developing relationships. Many students, when they're asked, now, how, do you, how are you going to be successful or what made you be successful or why aren't you successful? Many times they show, they state that they don't have a close relationship with someone that fosters that hope within them to support them through their high school program. And so the more that we can build positive and caring relationships with students, the more they can attach themselves with someone in, in terms of having that hope and having that guidance and having that support mechanism will allow those students to be successful and graduate from high school. So those are two key areas that we we'll need to focus on. If we can identify them, if we can provide them with the support system, that will help increase their success. But we have to work together as a team. And we have to make school relevant. We have to have relationships. We have to have high expectations. And we have to engage them in learning. And sometimes it's very challenging, especially for teachers when they have class sizes that are so large. Because they have 30, 35, 36 kids in a classroom, and if they have four or five, six periods with that many students, then you can see the challenge of a teacher to provide those close connections. Right. So how can we develop smaller learning communities and other effective programs to where we can have environments that are successful for students, that foster and build relationships for their success? It takes a school-wide approach, a district-wide approach, a community-wide approach to really build an environment that's going to support students. Well, how is the... Um 
county education plan kind of line up with the county vision? It, it lines up extremely well. Because as we look at the countywide vision, the county is looking at all the elements in the countywide vision to support our county into the future so we can have successful communities. Our education plan is tied the exact same way. We just completed a strategic plan from the county office. and We looked at in educational practices. We looked at community support. We looked at technology. How can we build those areas and really foresee the needs that we have in the future and tie that to our instructional programs that we're offering students? It takes that partnership I mentioned earlier, and so you have to include the families. You have to include, include the businesses, the faith-based organizations, so together we can see the vision that we've laid out for our organization as well as our school system and move toward that in a way that has that collaborative emphasis. With the county vision moving forward and our countywide uh, cradle to career, that ties together the vision in terms of having successful students in our county. That's our goal, and um, it's going to be building our, our pathway right to that. Right. Well, thank you very much, my friend. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. I come from a big family. I'm the oldest of six. To me, being the first person to go to college, it's like setting a standard, you know? My little brother is eight years old now. I challenge his curiosity. I challenge him to dream. I have to paint a picture for him that he can look up to and live up to and possibly be better than. My name is Jaquez, and I am your dividend. I grew up in the housing projects of Cleveland. I didn't even know that life could be any better than it was. Education for me has been a way to get away from the agony of what was normal life. I want to be able to impact the community, not just look back on where I came from, but to reach back to where I came from and pull some people up with me. My name is David, and I am your dividend. Thank you.